Okay, let's let's go ahead and get started. Haley, thanks for volunteering for the opening prayer. My dear, kind and gracious Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the opportunity we have to come and learn. We're grateful for all of the wonderful things we've been able to learn so far, and please bless us to continue to learn and to grow, and bless us as we um, learn this lesson that we will be able to uh, take it into our lives and use what we learn to better ourselves and better others, and bless us to have the spirit as we go throughout our day, through our lesson, and Bless us to all be able to participate in the best way we can. We say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about Augustine. Has anyone, I know the lesson just went up um, last night. So, but has anyone read the lesson by chance or skimmed it over? I have. Okay, so um, Emma, would you mind giving us like, a, I don't know, 10 or 15 second overview of your understanding of Augustine? Just obviously very high level, just from kind of what the lesson thought. Okay, well, what I got from Augustine mm -hmm. was just that, you know, he was a doer of the word. He didn't just sit around. Um, he was... Um, actively engaging himself in the work. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, that kind of ties into, I, I think the theme that I want to um, tie in as we're going throughout this entire lesson is Augustine was a big chain, um, influencer of Christian theology, Christian doctrine, the way the Christian world saw and understood the nature of God, the way they understood doctrine. And uh, another big player was, in addition to Augustine, was Thomas Aquinas. But today we're going to be talking about Augustine, and a big part also of how, what he, how he influenced our understanding of science and the scriptures, which I hope you'll find really interesting because I think it's really fascinating. Um, so just really quick before we go in there, so first Augustine, he's a Christian theologian um, and philosopher. He was a bishop. And he is known because we still have hit many of his writings today. And they were, like I mentioned, they were very influential in um, Western Christianity developing. Um, so he was a monk, and he had a lot of trouble, according to the records that we have. Um, he had a lot of trouble interpreting the Bible. He, um, he was part of a sect that was founded by an Iranian prophet in Persia, and it really focuses focused on, if you think about it, think of the gospel kind of blended with um, Eastern religions, um, kind of the power of energy, spiritual world of light, evil, this kind of struggle between good and evil, that kind of an understanding, cosmology. And so, however, when he's 31, he converted to Christianity. And what we're going to find, though, is remember, this is during the apostasy, right? So there's a huge difference between when we say Christianity here, there's already been a huge apostasy between early Christianity, the pure doctrine of the primitive church, versus the Christianity nowadays. Um, and so we have Augustine here. He's reading um, Paul's epistle to the Romans, and he's really taking that taking from that how the gospel transforms a person's life and changes behavior. And what we're going to find is it's really interesting when you're studying these early church fathers, they have the Bible. It was just that they differed um, both with contemporaries of their time and with uh, people in modern 21st century. But we differ based on interpretation. So it's the same biblical passages, just a different interpretation which is really important to be able to understand the correct interpretation because then when you're talking with friends, with colleagues, with acquaintances that you meet that are of other faiths or even of the LDS faith, to be able to really understand not only the scripture passages, but really understand for sure that you have the correct interpretation. It's very important. So Augustine's ordained a priest. He's made a bishop. Um, he's canonized in 1298. And he really worked to com 
convert the people to Christianity. So his friend said, described Augustine as a man who ate sparingly, worked tirelessly, despised gossip, shunned the temptations of the flesh, and exercised prudence in all financial stewardship. Okay. So Augustine interpreting scripture. So after his conversion, he learned from St. Ambrose to interpret the scriptures spiritually. What do you think that means, interpret the scriptures spiritually? Symbolically, sorry. Symbolically, figuratively, spiritually, similar. So he basically, from my understanding, is that he didn't, like, say you're considering a parable of the ten virgins. He didn't just look at it as ten virgins and, or was it twelve virgins? Oh, never mind. No, nope. right. you're right. It's, huh? It, it's ten. Good job. You, you're Sorry, right. I'm just like trying to make sure no one, you don't hear any background noise. But um, he didn't interpret it like that with just the versions and just oil lamps and just the bridegroom. He interpreted it um, as we interpreted it now, um, which was why the oil meant so much more and the virgins meant so much more and the bridegroom also meant so much more than what... Um, was being read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, perfect. So there's this balance, and it's a very delicate balance when studying the scriptures, right? Because there's a difference between, um, it's really important that you that we interpret correctly what's spiritual and what's temporal. And um, and like the comment meant, made, that that's exactly right. So different things like the parables, you have other um, let's take Revelation um, in the book of Revelation that John wrote where certain things, the dragon came, swept three, a third of the stars from heaven with his tail, different things like that we understand symbolically. Now, is there danger in getting too eager in symbolizing or spiritualizing the scriptures? Is there a danger in going too far? Hunter says yes. Why do you think yes, Hunter? then we would like not do anything like it gets so symbolically that everything is symbolic and nothing is like we can do nothing because it's all symbolic mm -hmm. right um exactly so for instance let's take an example and this is this is a real life example that i've heard i heard once uh from someone who is actually a member of the church but they said okay so in the book of mormon we have all of these wars we've got captain roni we've got an alkaya and amaron and um, the Lamanite Wars, there's all of these war chapters, but that doesn't really apply to us today. We don't really have wars, so what we need to do to apply this to ourselves is to symbolize it. So spiritual warfare and some different things like that. Now, that can be beneficial in a sense, right? To a certain extent, it can be beneficial, but it's very important because that we don't go overboard on that because the main purpose of Mormon Moroni including those war chapters in there, was to be applied literally, applied physically. Literal wars in our day, little, literal wars in the Nephite day, and comparing and contrasting the two. So what you're going to see with Augustine is he, he took this just a little a, a bit too far, and is specifically in the realm of science. And that's what we're going to be kind of hitting into today is the balance between science and the scriptures. So... Be, and you might think, well, what does Augustine have to do with, you know, science and religion today? Augustine played a huge part, a huge part in influencing how um, the Christian world, how the LDS world, how um, many re people of religion view the supposed conflicts that they might see between science and religion. And Augustine was a huge player in influencing how we look at that today in ways that's not the best, and that's why we're going to be talking about it. So the other thing Augustine did a big thing about was in changing how we viewed God. Um, and right, and we talked about this, hit this heart pretty hard last week, right? The concept of the Trinity, the concept of you have to have priesthood authority, understanding the true nature of God, which is so critical, right? Because if you don't understand who God is, you can't become like God. Um, you'll be working to become like someone who isn't really God, which can lead to dangerous roads. So 
Um, the other big thing, so if the, at the end of the day, all you need to know about Augustine, at the end of the day, the important thing is what he was trying to do is he was trying to merge Christian doctrine with Greek philosophy. Because you had these church fathers coming in, and they were, instead of being content with saying, okay, God's truth is true, they said, well, somehow we need to merge these two and, you know, take some parts from Christianity, take some parts from Greek philosophy, and create our own Greek guys ver Grecian version of Christianity. And that's really where Catholicism came from, the Roman Catholic Church. It came from this comp these compromises with Roman Greek culture. Now, why would Greek culture be so dangerous? Does anyone know some specific reasons why Greek culture is very dangerous from a gospel perspective? Okay, idols. They had several gods, and we and know that there's only one. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Haley, several gods. Was someone else trying to make a comment? I think it... No, Haley hit it, so it's okay. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Right. So, some of the others I'm seeing, irresponsibility, immorality. Does anyone remember when we talked a little bit, this was a couple months ago, so it was kind of a while ago, but um, the Greek version of education versus the gospel perspective of education. Anyone remember that? It's okay if not for sure. But Okay, we'll just do a we'll do a quick recap. So the Greek perspective of education is it's very philosophical, right? It's very um, mental. It's very get together in rooms and study and study and learning is the end, right? It's this loving of study and loving of just embracing learning, right? Now, when we study the scriptures, how, it, can anyone give me a scripture verse where learning was the end or God talked about how we should just love and just our end goal should be embracing just learning and studying and that's the purpose of life. There are a lot of good education mm -hmm. scriptures, but none that say that that's the end goal, that's the purpose of our life. Right, right, right. Hunter and Haley got it. So what then is the purpose of Biblical or gospel education. Well, when you study biblical education or you study it from the Book of Mormon, you study um, from any of the scriptures, right, Hunter got it. It's to become like Christ. It's to, in the end, we're trying to work, we're in a telestial world, and we're trying to first move to a terrestrial world and then move to a celestial. Does anyone know the difference between a telestial, terrestrial, and celestial from your kind of a lifestyle? Kind of really short in like a sentence or two. You have like celestial, which is like the sun, and then the terrestrials, the moon, the light and stuff, mm -hmm. and the celestials, like the stars and the earth. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect, Hunter. So it's really fascinating, and this is really a way, and and that's exactly why God gave us the stars in the heavens, right? Is to teach us the difference between the light, right? And when you look at the stars, if you had to pick between trying to find your way to a place that you had never gone before, if you're lost and you're trying to find your way through a neighborhood, which would you prefer? Being there with, on a cloudy night when you there's absolutely no moonlight, only starlight, or when you have a full moon or noonday when the sun is at its highest, right? You'd want to be able to try to find your way in, in when the sun was at its highest with, with light. And so that's a good visual you can think of. But specifically when it comes to, the, when it applies to education, a telestial world is all focused about on yourself. So if, if, if we have an individual who only cares about themselves, so this would be people who are dishonest, people who really have a hard time living the Ten Commandments, who they're really self-centered when they, at the end of the day, when they think about their goals, their life, all they care about is themselves. 
um, num looking out for number one. That, that's the telestial world. Moving to a terrestrial world means people who people who are in the terrestrial world will be people who are interested in serving others. They don't care about themselves. They care about serving mankind, serving the people around them, helping people, um, giving everything they can to help others. But and you might think, well, that sounds like the celestial kingdom, right? So I'm going to I'm going to open up just in case. Um, and wants to take a stab at what would be the difference between, if that's the terrestrial kingdom, what would be the difference between that and the celestial kingdom? Okay, celestial has the temple covenants, right? What's different about the goals? So if the telestial, the goal is looking out for yourself, and terrestrial is looking out to serve other people, what would the goal of the celestial kingdom be? Where Sorry, was someone trying to make a comment? If you were, if you don't mind repeating it, cut off. Yeah, I was about to say to serve God. Perfect. Exactly. Yep. You got it. And that's the that's exactly right. So the celestial kingdom, everything is about consecration to God, living by every law that comes out of the mouth of God. God says do this. Everyone instantly obeys. And that's their whole goal. At the end of the day, they don't care about anything besides serving God, building up God's kingdom, building up their father's mission, right, like Christ was. And of course now, and, and that doesn't mean you're not caring for other people, right? Because inherent, if you obey God, God is going to be telling you to go and serve others. But at the end of the day, your goal isn't just to serve others. Your goal is to serve God. And that envelops, like Hunter was saying, envelops everything. Now, that gets back, so that gets back to education. So in the biblical sense of education, everything you learn is focusing on serving God now. You don't learn and then go serve. You go serve and you learn while you're serving. And this is this is the system of education. It's really foreign to the system of education that we have going on today. But really in Brigham Young's day, Joseph Smith's day, that was the whole goal. The goal was not, um, you know, going and sit in class. Right, because nowadays, what do we have? You go to kindergarten, and why do you go to kindergarten? So you can go to first grade. And why do you go to first grade? So you can go to middle school. And why do you go to middle school? So you can go to high school. And why do you go to high school? So you can graduate and go to college. And why do you go to college? You go to college so you can get your bachelor's. Why do you get your bachelor's? So you can get your master's. Why do you go, get, go to get your master's? So you can go and get a PhD. Why do you get your PhD? So you can go get another PhD and eventually retire and end your life doing no good, right? That's kind of the... Mo, um, framework we have for our education system today. Well, God's education system is no. Take all that aside and he, you pray, you get on your knees and you pray. You say, God, what do you want me to do? And he says, you need to go and change the world in this area. And you go, wow, I have no idea anything about that subject. And so you go and study and you're studying and using what you're studying at the same time, right? And then it's not boring, and then you're not sitting in a room, a stuffy room with a textbook, memorizing dates and facts that absolutely don't matter and never will matter, really, right? It's about sitting down and saying, okay, God says you need your specific mission in life is to go into more of a science field, specifically maybe chemistry. And you're going to, and I want you to do some certain things in chemistry. So you go, okay. And you study with that goal in mind, but not just the goal in mind, with the mission while you're doing it at the same time. And for every person, that's going to look different, right? For some people, maybe that their area is more in media, then they're going to be practicing it while they're um, learning in media. With other people, science, maybe agriculture, maybe economics, business. But everything you do, it's not go learn and then go serve, right? Think about how... We do bishops today, right? Does When God calls a bishop, he calls a bishop and says, you need to go go to bishop school to learn how to be a good bishop. We'll see you back in two years, and then we'll sustain you as the bishop of this ward, right? He doesn't do that, right? He calls and says, you're called to be a bishop, and you're going to learn while you're doing it. 
And maybe that's harder and you learn with your mistakes, but it's more effective and you're doing something with it. And so that was the big difference. And it was this complete conflict. This was the whole thing going on with the Maccabees, with Hanukkah, with um, later now with primitive Christianity and still is going today. Everything in the world today, everything in the education world is all this big battle of butting heads between God's system of thinking about the world and this Greek or more of a pagan way of looking at the world where, and it's tricky, right? It seems very tricky because God wants us to learn, right? Just like Haley said, there's tons of scriptures in the, in the standard works about learning and studying the right way. But, um, but learning is not the end. We don't l learn because we just love it and it's just fun and right. Well, you could, but that would be more of a celestial and maybe terrestrial kind of a worldview. If you want to move to a celestial worldview, it's all about I love God and everything else is only a tool to help me um, be able to fulfill what God's calling me to do. All right, Christian says we learn so that we will know how to act. Exactly right. Okay, so we've got Augustine um, kind of trying to blend it with this Greek. So you can see how this is dangerous, right? Because when you start blending this Greek, you start getting... And this is where you got, right, in early, um, the early Catholic Church, this, the apostasy, the Dark Ages, you had monks who would retire from the world. They didn't have families, and they just shut themselves up in cloisters and learn. And maybe some of them were some of the brightest people, smarter, knew more than any of us will ever know in our lives. But at the end of the day, it didn't really do a whole lot of good, right? They didn't really do a whole lot of good with what they were learning. And that's what the danger is in spiritualizing the scriptures, not saying, okay, here's the scriptures. How does this apply to the real world? And that is exactly where this philosophy took um, Augustine and a couple of, of the, really the church for a long period with science. Right. Annika says, you don't really understand the calling until a couple days before you're released. Right. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Because that's God's perspective. You don't learn and then just go practice it. Right. You're constantly doing something new. You're constantly growing. God isn't about growing for four years in college and then stopping and then just practicing it. Right. He's about practicing and learning all at the same time throughout your entire life. Um, it's a radical concept of education, but it's all over through the scriptures and the words of the prophets. And it really changes and makes education fun and exciting so let's talk about science in the scripture so this really the story kind of takes um the these two you can picture it, these two cars on a road right you have science and religion a lot of people just picture them going to going in the same direction as fast coming together and they're going to have a collision right they're coming towards each other as fast as they can do, and it's only a matter of time before a collision happens, right? Well, so this collision happened with Aristotle's, Augustine, sorry, Augustine's understanding of the gospel and how he changed how the church thought about the gospel and science with Galileo. So Galileo was famous because he made a statement called, he, where he said, the intention of the Holy Spirit is to teach us how one goes to heaven not how the heavens go. So is that true or is that false? Or something in between? Okay, Hunter, do you want to give your thoughts? How is it in between? I can do both, like, I can teach you how to go to heaven, like, be righteous, that's basically how you go to heaven, kind of, I guess, um, and I can tell you, like, this, like, through somebody else's example, like, this is how heaven goes, like, the missionaries or something like that, I guess, mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. right. So when Galileo made this statement, this was if, if uh, I'm most of you for a recap of Galileo's story, right? Galileo started introducing some scientific principles that were true, but were in conflict with the tradition the church had had for many, many, many years. And that tradition they had gotten from um, Aristotle. 
Now, so when Galileo got up to defend this, the church said, you're contradicting the scriptures. You cannot do this. We will burn you at the stake. You are contradicting the scriptures. And so Galileo said, stop. He said, I'm a scientist, and I'm not contradicting the scriptures because the scriptures, that's a different realm. There's the scriptures, and then there's my science. And the scriptures teach us how to get to heaven, how to be righteous. They teach us the religion, but they don't teach us the science principles. Therefore, there's no conflict between the two. Do you see any problems with that statement at all? Okay, Sabrina made a very good comment. The spirit can help us recognize truth no matter what that truth pertains to. Okay, Hunter, go ahead. Um, I think that God probably knows a lot about both. And so he uses both to, and I guess Galileo could have used that as an excuse, but probably wasn't all that true. He just kind of put his theory out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's what people do. Mm -hmm. May not be right, but that's what people do. Yep. So Augustine and Thomas Aquinas had taught that the writers in the Old Testament didn't mean to teach anything about astronomy. So they said if there's anything mentioned, you know, Moses, the creation story, Psalms talks a lot about the solar system, anything like that, they didn't know what they were talking about or, you know, they didn't mean to say anything. It's all symbolic, right? It's just, it's let's focus on the stuff about being nice and loving our neighbor as Christ loves us and let's focus on not stealing, not committing adultery and let's, you know, they just didn't really mean to teach anything about real science or real creation. And Augustine said, he said, one does not read in the gospel that the Lord said, you know, okay, he said, Christ wanted in the gospels to make us Christians, not mathematicians. So people will use the Galileo story a lot. You're going to hear this when you start going into college or and any time someone, a student makes a comment or something, well, what about the scriptures? That's, they're always going to use the story of Galileo. They're going to say, here's an example of the same thing that happens today. You have a scientist, Galileo, who we know was a true scientist, true science principles, and you had a church that was holding to the Bible. They came in conflict, and who won out? We know that Galileo won out. And it's just the same in our day. We have um, the scripture, specifically in the LDS church, we have all of the standard works teach the creation story and that the theory of evolution is not accurate. It's not in harmony with the scriptures. And so they say, well, yeah, your scriptures teach that, but our scientists today are saying the opposite. So it's the same thing with Galileo. Who's going to win out? Well, we need to keep science in its domain and we need to keep religion in its domain. Now, so why, so, so this can be confusing to say, well, what's going on, right? Um, and let me clarify, just so when I say the three, I mean the theory of organic evolution, Darwinian evolution, macro evolution, one of those. And, um, and if you're interested, there's a whole slew of um, profit statements. I can pull that up when we get through that. But, um, so why is there this discord? The Roman, and as we're going into this sub subject, I just want, I want to make sure everyone feels completely comfortable, completely feel comfortable to raise questions, raise comments, disagreements. If you have something, please feel completely free and completely encouraged to make, make a voice, make a comment, and definitely feel free to make any comment if you if you want to for sure especially in a subject like this so the roman catholic church it was an error right about principles relating to astronomy and this caused contention with true principles of science um, but the problem wasn't that the church was going to the bible right the bible didn't teach that the earth was the center of the universe where was that coming from? It was coming from Aristotle and Augustine emerging all these Greek ideas and trying to spiritualize the scriptures. That's where the error came from. It didn't actually come from the scriptures. So whenever you see these conflicts, it comes from mixing religion with false science or 
vice versa, mixing science with false religion. And that's what happened with the situation with Galileo. They had accepted this false science by the church. The church had accepted this false science, and that caused serious problems. So that hundreds of years later, when true science was coming, they were so stuck in the false science, they couldn't embrace the true science. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, um, right, and now this is so, this is so important. So in the, in the scriptures, we see people like Abraham, you see Moses, you see Joshua, you see great men who understood science. They understood principles of astronomy that we're not even, I mean, what Abraham understood about astronomy, no one in our age has even come close to. Um, and Joseph F. Smith, President Joseph F. Smith made the statement in a first presidency message. He said, man by searching cannot find out God. Never unaided will he discover the truth about the beginning of life, human life. The Lord must reveal himself or remain unrevealed. The same is true of the facts relating to the origin of Adam's race. God alone can reveal them. So what this gets back to is there is complete harmony between science and religion because they're the same thing. The gospel is God's truth. The gospel is the truth in science, the truth in music, the truth in art, the truth in film. That's It's all part of the gospel because God is a God of truth, right? And he doesn't have different areas where he has church on one side and then his different areas of expertise, right? It's all part of one, one cohesive truth. And... And so that's so important. So we ask the question, well, should reliance, religion and science be kept separate? Um, if you keep the sep religion and science separate, religion becomes a feel-good nothingness, right? It's it's that thing that's so boring. It's just, oh, yeah, you know, yawning about because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really change what you're doing in real life, right? And I don't know about you, but I'm interested in real life. I'm interested about things that I'm studying for career, I'm interested in studying things I'm going to be going into for doing real hardcore um, things I can touch, things I can see, things I can, um, things that actually matter, things that make a difference for, with your family life, with your personal life, with the way you interact and live, how, how and when and why you move in certain, to certain different locations, um, how you decide what decisions you make in your life, all of this has to, so if you try to separate the two and say, okay, well, go to church on Sunday, right? That's what the ram, the, the people if, with the Ramiumptum, I'm trying to remember the name of them in the, the Zoramites, right, in the Book of Mormon, with the Ramiumptum. They said they went to church on Sunday, and then they forgot about it, and then went on with their week, and then they went back to church on Sunday, and they were, you know, they're like, okay, well, everything's in harmony because, you know, they are they just never overlap the two. And that's why it's, um, and I, that's why I put this link in here. It's going to be in the slides. But if you go to this um, website, it has what all the prophets have taught on science and religion and how you have to have both of them together. And how when you have both of them together, John Taylor, he made a really good quote. I just love it. He said, when we set, try to separate the two, he said, religion just becomes fried broth. And then he said, it's something you can eat it all day and at night and be as far from being satisfied as when you began. It's not real. It's not um, part of the real world. And that's why, and that's why it's so important to remember. To remember, there's no difference between the two. They're the same thing, and that's why it's so important. Like with the story of um, Galileo and the church, right? The best situation to have been in would have been to say, "No, okay, let's stop, everyone. Let's go back to what we know. Okay, we know X, Y, and Z because this is what the Lord has revealed. So let's go and get." The true science, the true history, the true archaeology, the true art, the true music, and bring those with the revelation that we know comes straight from God. Does anyone have any comments? They'd want to questions, maybe disagreements, anything?
why do people like separate religion and um, science? Mm -hmm. What happens when you, if religion becomes a feel good nothingness, something that's boring, something that, you know, think about it. Like if you're, when you're in um, a class or anything and they're talking about the gospel and it's just boring, what happens when you turn religion into something that's boring, non, not relevant, and just emotional? Right. Right. No one wants to study it because who would want to study something like that, right? It's like. When you reach four years old, you know, Dr. Seuss might be a little bit, or fairy tales might be a little bit old, right? You want to move on to some things that really matter to the real world. And religion does matter in the real world. The true gospel really does. So when you pr try to separate the two, it turns the gospel into something that's not really the gospel. It's not, if you, you might try to separate science and religion, but you can't because if you do, Science is no longer science, and religion is no longer religion. They might have the same names, but they're not really religion, and they're not really science. Yes, it's not real if you don't have any use for it. Right, exactly. So what happens is when you don't understand, you don't understand, okay, what is, how is religion real? How does it apply to politics? How does it apply to property rights? How does it apply when you're trying to make business decisions, when our generals and war, war leaders are making decisions about where to go, where to place troops, how to place troops, what the process is between offering treaties versus warnings. Do you offer a warning? Do you not offer a warning? If you're going to invade a country, should you offer them a warning or should you not? Question. Guess what? The scriptures answer that question. How about taxes? Are income taxes good? Are they bad? Should we have taxes on like our money before, after? What's the what is the big deal? Should it just be on? Should we have library? Should we not have library? What what's the big what's the answer to those questions? Right? The scriptures and the and religion has answers for all of those questions. How about your family? How about if you have a child who's struggling with um, and people say, oh, yeah, people, you might say, oh, of course, well, we always use, right, the scriptures to influence how we deal with, like, child discipline or families or anything like that, right? And, but if you think about it, how many times, I haven't, I haven't seen too many instances where um, too often I saw a parent said, you know, okay, I have a son or a daughter who might be struggling with, let's say, pornography or, um, fornication or leaning into those areas or having temptations. I haven't seen too often them say, well, let's pull out the Book of Mormon right here. Alma talks to Coriantum. He gives us the perfect example. Alma gives us the perfect example of how fathers and mothers should deal with, how the conversation should run, what pro topics you approach in what order, how you approach them, why you approach them, when you approach it. All of that is answered right in the scriptures, right? And, but if we spiritualize and go, oh, no, it's just about being nice, right? You just, you just read it just, you know, to get some warm fuzzies inside. Then you miss it. Mm hmm Right. Okay, so does anyone, does that kind of answer your question a little bit? So that, it, and, and it won't make complete sense until every, for every single one of you, it's something you have to, Come to understand yourself as you start studying the scriptures. And that's why um, if really study, for instance, like the teachings of President Ezra Taft Benson. It's the big, um, it's not the little manual that, I mean, read the little manual that the church does in Relief Society and others for him. That's good. But the, there's a big one that's uh, about maybe two, three inches thick, and it was approved by um, <clears throat> President Monson, um, President Gordon B. Hinckley, and President Benson. And it has his um, teachings on all these different subjects. He, I mean, he talks about music. He talks about different movies. He talks about parents. He talks about children. He talks about all these. And it's all by topics. You can just look it up. Start studying. Start going and looking out, right? This is, this is the example. I love President Joseph Filling Smith. When he was just a little boy, he was a really good example of someone hungering 
and thirsting after righteousness, right? It's not going to be interesting. It's not going to make sense until you make the decision to go out there and study it and come to know for yourself. Um, when President Joseph Fielding Smith was just little, this is before he even reached his teen years, um, all of the boys in the neighborhood, they loved to play baseball. He loved to play baseball. But it would happen very often where they'd be playing baseball, and in the middle of the game, they'd just turn around, and they'd be like, where, where, where'd he go? Where'd Joseph go? And, and they'd be looking for him. And they'd finally find him in the barn, up reading the Book of Mormon, just pouring over the Book of Mormon, right? The, now, this is the before LDS.org. This is before they had the enzyme, before they had it all, you know, nice, searchable. This is just the black and white text of the book. And he was up there, and why was he doing it? I mean, he's this little boy. Why was he doing that? It was because he wanted so badly to know. He wanted to, he wanted to know why things work the way they do, how they were supposed to work, how to fix problems, why to fix the problems, how he could go about doing that. And he, and he, it's something he had to do on his own, but he really showed that's the example of hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And when, when you go about that, that is the way you'll be able to understand the truth about science, the truth about how religion applies to the real world, and be able to find all those answers that you need. So I haven't been reading the chat box too, but too um, thoroughly. So does anyone have a comment that they want to make that they either did or didn't put through the chat box that they'd want to want to make? Right. Christian, right. So what are modern day prophets that they teach about their, their scripture too, right? And that's why it's very important. And especially in our day, prophets are attacked. Our latter day prophets are heavily attacked. You, President Joseph Fielding Smith is completely maligned on the internet. There are very few people out there who really are supporting the integrity and the good name of President Joseph Fielding Smith because he was a stick, strong person who stood up for truth. He was someone who didn't mince words when it came to doctrine. He say, said the truth how it was, really was. And he wasn't angry about it or, you know, really cruel or vicious. He wasn't. He was the most gentlest person in the whole world. And yet, but he stood for truth. And so... Being able to know, okay, well, what did he say? Why did people not like it? Because if when there's that kind of a conflict, you know, wait a minute, it should raise red flags. When when something's really controversial, it should raise red flags, and you should go, okay, wait a minute, there's something important about this, right? Because Satan is always going to try to cover up the truth, the most important truths. And that's why, I mean, you see... Coming back to Augustine, right? You have the Trinity. We talked about this last week. The Trinity is huge for understanding exaltation, right? If you don't understand the true relationship of a child to a father and how that exam how you progress and how what your the focus of your life should be submitting to the Father, obeying the Father, having all of your goal, all of your dreams be building up the kingdom of the Father. If you don't understand that and the true relationship you have with different members of the Godhead, your salvation, you're damned. You cannot achieve salvation because to have salvation is to know God. So you have, right, the Trinity. So you ask yourself, why is this such a huge issue? Why to this day is the huge conflict, right? You talk to any um, evangelical Christians or um, anyone who has follows more after the Trinitarian um, Council of Nicaea kind of theology, and this is a big deal to them, right? It's a big deal to us. It's kind of a deal breaker. So you ask yourself, why is this so important? Why is it so controversial? Why is it so heated? And what you'll come down to is because this is incredibly, incredible, sorry, incredibly critical to salvation, which is the whole goal of life, right, so seeking knowledge out of the best books, yep, just like we could take the truth to be hard, yep, it's every single one of us, right, different times when it can be hard to, 
hard to really accept different truth because it conflicts with how we want to live our lives. Okay, so let's talk really quick in the last 10 minutes about original sin. What in the world is original sin? It's kind of up on the screen. So if somebody wants to read it or they already know and wants to make a comment, go ahead. Original sin would be Adam and Eve, right? The fall? Yeah. So how would, what what would be the understanding of Adam and Eve that is different in original sin by, than what we understand? Concept of originals that right Sabrina and Alex. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Oh yeah, no, perfect. So Sabrina and Alex made a really good comment. They said the concept of original sin is pretty much blaming them for our fallen state, right? Now this is a twist of truth, right? So does anyone know? So uh, original sin essentially teaches Adam and Eve were um, in open rebellion against God. They openly wanted to disobey God. They took the fruit. And forever after that, we pay the penalty um, for all time for uh, what they did. Now, is this 100% error, or is there some truth mixed in this? All right, Sabrina, if Adam and Eve had stayed in the garden, we wouldn't be here. That's a big, so an essential, in, 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 a, in, in a way, right, what they did does influence us, right? But like Annika says, so it's saying we're fallen with no immediate option for repentance, right? So what this comes down to is blaming environment for our fallen natures. Now, we do live in a fallen world, right? When your spirit leaves the spirit world, it comes into this body. Brigham Young talked about how this body is hard. He said, I don't, none of us really understand how much the body, how hard the body makes it to see things clearly, to be able to understand, to be able to to act to be able to overcome evil. The body is definitely something that's hard. It's that natural man that's hard to overcome, right? But it is possible to overcome. Christ showed us. He was born. He had a body. Um, he had the effect. So the consequences of the fall, is this is really incredib incredibly important. So Bruce McConkie said the three pillars of our, of our church, of our faith, are, does anyone know what the three pillars are the most important things? You have to know these three important things to be able to understand the gospel. Close. They're, they're principles. So this is all in the Book of Mormon. Christ is part of it. There's the creation is number one. Now, what in the world? Why, why, why is the creation that important? I guess it's just the first thing that the missionaries teach you. I feel like, I guess if, if it's not the first discussion, then it must be important. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Right. So the just like Hunter said, and and I'm sorry, Hunter, if I if I heard your comment wrong, definitely let me know. It was a little it was a little muffled, but I think what you said was the creations what we first teach, the missionaries first teach when they're trying to introduce the gospel. Okay. So exactly right. And there's a reason why they do that because to be able to understand anything in the gospel, you have to understand the creation. You have to understand that God created this world. You have to understand the plan of salvation. You have to understand the counsel. You have to understand that there is a plan. God creates this perfect world, right? It's this world that physically the earth was close to his solar system. This is, um, and so it's it's this perfect world. There's, there's no death. There's no pain. There's no suffering. There's no disease. There's no sickness. 
And then what happens is we have the fall. And the fall happens, and all of a sudden, the world is becoming, it's instead of maintaining this perfect state, it's fallen, and it's now we have death. Now we have pain. Now we have sickness. Now we have disease. Now we have um, our bodies are continually deteriorating. This is, you know, when Adam lived, his, their bodies, they were taller, they were stronger, they were more beautiful looking, they had more intelligence, their minds were stronger. Brigham Young talked a lot about this and Joseph Smith. And so the ancients, during Adam's time, they, they were very um, an amazing people. They lived for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Now, over time, as Earth's history has progressed, the lifespans have become shorter, um, and our bodies have gradually, over time, deteriorated. Now, that is so important because if you don't understand, and all of us have a fallen nature inside us, right? We have this natural man, this natural man that when the alarm goes off at 6 in the morning, you don't want to get up, right? Or 5 or 5.30, whenever you get up. Um, you don't want to get up, right? You don't want to. You're not just like, oh, man, I just want to put off sleep for me. You know, or let's say you have a choice to eat. Um, something that's really bad for you versus some, that's something that's good for you, right? Not too many would go, oh, you know, I just want to eat that broccoli instead of that ice cream or those donuts. I mean, you know, the, the broccoli is 100% times better, right? You might know that mentally. You might know that it's better for you, but that natural man inside you goes, right, Sabrina, I'd agree with you. Sometimes you do, and that is your natural man being overcome by your spirit, right? But your natural man is the one that wants to just do what you want to do and not um, be disciplined, not be controlled, not um, be directed to doing what God wants you to do. Now, if you don't understand that about the creation, you don't understand the fall, you don't understand, and this comes back to um, a question that Jen's asked. So we use the term spiritually dead a lot. Um, be, so spiritual life, to have life means you're in the presence of God, right? You have, um, which you have to be perfect. So every weakness, to whatever degree of weakness you are, it's kind of like a scale. So you have Christ on one side, God on, the Father on one side, and you have um, outer darkness or Lucifer on the other. Those are the two extremes. The one has zero light, the one has 100% light. To have, to be to have spiritual life is to be 100% life, and if you're completely spiritually dead, then you're with Lucifer. You're in outer darkness. There's no light there. There's no ability. The Savior cannot go there. And that's why they say, that's why you have to be willing to accept that Christ, accept Christ as the Savior, be willing to accept and bow the knee because and accept some of his light to be able to be released from Lucifer's power at all. Now, every single one of us are somewhere in between, right? It's not just heaven or hell. There's a scale. So you, to a degree right now, you are spiritually dead to a certain degree. And hopefully, all of us are moving up, right? So over time, we're become, we get gain more and more life and light. And as we gain that more life and light, we move closer to the Savior. And hopefully, ultimately, we're working towards the goal of being released from any spiritual death at all. And that's what Christ did with the atonement. And that's why it's so important to understand the creation, the fall, and the atonement, the correct understandings of the two. Because if you don't understand that you're fallen and that this world is fallen, that the physical world is fallen, when you look outside your window and you see a tree there, that tree is fallen compared to the tree that was in the Garden of evil, Eden, or in heaven, that's a fallen tree. It's more decayed. It's more diseased. It's more spiritually dead. All of these are types and shadows. When you drink your water, our water is not as pure as the water was at the time of Adam, Eve, probably even the time of Noah. It's deteriorated over time. So you understand that. You understand, okay, we live in a fallen world, but God's not leaving us in that fallen world, right? That's the importance of the atonement. Christ comes down because the Father asks him to, and he pays the penalty. He pays the penalty to be able to, if we're willing, and we're willing to change and repent, then he can release us and help us to be released from that spiritual death, be released from this fallen state, 
and be restored back to the state at the time of the creation and then ultimately become exalted. So that's why, and that is why it's so important. That's why people like Augustine are important to understand because you must understand where these ideas came from, how they're different, how they're the same as the gospel, how they're different. And because if you don't, this is all, this is not just, you know, just fun information, no trivia, right? This is information that if you, your understanding of this, your ability to achieve salvation hangs in the balance right now based on whether you really understand it, really understand it. Um, and that's why, so as you're going through here, as you're going through and re reviewing the rest of this lesson on Augustine, Really take the time to ask yourself, do I really know the truth of the scriptures? What they teach on these subjects. What is the truth and what's the error? And then when you're studying that, be careful to go to the very best sources. The very best sources is, number one, the standard works. Number two would be Joseph Smith. And then after that, you have the greatest gospel scholars. You have, like, President Joseph Fielding Smith. You have Elder Bruce McConkie. You have... Um, Brigham Young, you have John Taylor, Wilford Ojo, Heber C. Kimmel, you have the greatest gospel scholars of our age. And then, and, and going to the best is so important because if you go to the best, then you will learn the best, right? If you want to be the best piano player in the world, would you go to an amateur or someone who was average? No, right? If you want to be the greatest, you will study from the greatest. And that's why it's so important when you think about, okay, who, who, who do I choose? When I have free time, what do I think about? When I can just pick any book I want to read off the shelf and it's just my choice, who do I choose to go and study? And who you choose, what you're attracted to will tell you what kind of a level you're at. And sometimes, and so that, so if you want to achieve the level say, I want to be like Joseph Smith, I want to be like the Savior, you'll go to them for the answers and you'll go to them for your recreation. You'll go to them when you want to study and understand a topic in any area, not just the gospel, but literature, family life, love, romance, um, novels, the correct understanding good novels, history, science, everything. Okay. Does anyone have a last comment before we close out for today? Does, does this kind of make sense? I'd like to I'd like to hear a little bit from you before we close, just on to see does this make sense? What seems a little com confusing? Does anyone anything seem a little confusing? Because if it does, um, we won't cover it today, but we'll try to um, answer those questions next week. How about some like um, Jens or Oakley or Sam or Spencer, Talmadge? What do you think? Monica, would you mind um, elaborating a little bit? You said, I wish it were easier to apply it to our lives. Do you mind? What What are you thinking there? The natural man makes it hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we might know it in our head, but it's hard to live it. Amen, Annika. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's that's the beauty of, that's, that's really the true beauty of the atonement, right? That's what really is understanding that God, I, I love, there's a scripture in Alma where he talks about, he said, the Lord was angry with the people because they wouldn't believe that Christ could forgive them and could help them. And I remember when I first read that, I was like, what? I was like, I mean, that would seem something pretty easy to believe until I realized that I fell into that trap many times too, thinking, oh, this is something too hard, you know, I'm, I'm working toward it a little bit at a time, but this is just something that can't really, I can't tackle this. And without realizing, you can, 
God gave you the command, you can do it. He can help you. But you sure were, wish it were easier. <laughs> Anyone have any other thoughts? Benjamin, Christian, Hunter. I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, so in the lesson briefing or whatever, mm -hmm. um, they talk about a spiritual city of God. What exactly does that mean? With um, Augustine? Yeah. Um, that I'm. I, I don't want to get into that um, right now. That's a that's a perfect question. Could, do you mind if I, we jumped into that at the beginning of the next lesson? Would that be okay? I I, I wouldn't want to keep you guys here too long since we're already over. Sure. But thank you for asking. That's a perfect, beautiful, wonderful question. We'll do that first thing tomorrow, next next Monday. Okay, if we don't have any more questions or comments, um, Sabrina's little brother wants to say the closing prayer. So I guess we'll go ahead and have the closing prayer. Thanks, Sabrina's little brother. I don't know your name, but thank you. Appreciate it. He's Andrew. My name is Indigo Mentoya. Andrew just said it Okay. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the sick. Thank you that we could come to the um, class connect. And um, please help us to apply the lesson to our lives and um, have fun while doing it and I say it's sincere Jesus Christ, amen. Bye. Amen.